What do you remember about Thanksgiving when you were a kid? Something I remember. It's pretty common, isn't it? It's a very special time. And all the kids were together, all the grandkids were together, and now in those times every 10 or 20 years when we get together, one of us will look at one other one and say, who exactly is that? Because you don't remember getting seen them in so long that you don't even remember who they are. But, uh, but growing up, it's a very special time. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at a passage out of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is a book written by, we don't know who. They always try to say it's Paul's writings, but if you'll notice in all of Paul's writings, he writes them as a letter. Greetings to the people wherever, and at the end, say hello to, and send my love to, and send my regards to, so and so. Well, Hebrews doesn't have that, so we don't really know who wrote it, but when they were coming up with what's going to be in the Bible, It's one of those books that needed to be there. We're going to read verses Hebrews 9, verses 19 through 28. And what we're doing is a comparison of old, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're doing a comparison of the Jewish sacrificial rites and, and the sacrifice that Jesus did for us on the cross. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law, to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. And you know what I thought about at that point? The flies must be terrible there. Can you imagine sprinkling blood on every, and especially on the scroll, and all the people, and everywhere around? And it's just like, man, it just looks like it's a big mess there. But maybe that's part of the idea is for them to understand that uh, what it says in the next verse. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Typically, we think of when we have a sin in our life that we are to be punished for that. Well, what they, what they understood was that, that God gave them the commands that something else could be punished for the sins that we commit. And so that's why they came up with the idea of sacrificing animals. Instead of sacrificing themselves, they would sacrifice an animal to cleanse them of whatever the sin was that they had in their lives. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Now what we need to understand out of that part is is that Christ came out of heaven. We celebrate Christmas and he's being born as a baby, but we also understand that Christ has been around with God and with the Holy Spirit since the beginning. You know, and it's just like, we can't comprehend some things. There actually was no beginning because they've always been there. Always. And I, I, can, I can understand continuing on for, into the future, but I just really can't comprehend in my own little brain the idea that God has always been there, that there was nothing before him. And where did it start? Well, it didn't start. God's always been there. And so when we think about the difference, Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So the verse before that where it said, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. Copies of the heavenly things or the things of earth where they made the temple, or, or made the, the temple, and and they they wrote down the scrolls, and they had all those things were copies of what would be in heaven. 
It was necessary then for them to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, which is referring to Jesus Christ as to be the sacrifice for everything. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one, but he entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Let me turn this off right here. So we won't be bothered with that little singing music. Back up one slide, Lord. Just as an, as an aside, the middle of that. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. That's the verse that people used to say you have a certain lifespan, it's already been it's already been set in stone the day that you will die. But all it says is we die one time and then face the judgment. We don't die many times, but that one time and and then to face judgment. And so people take that, and it's like they, not that translation, but but uh, but the other translation, I guess King James that, that they use, is one that says that that you are appointed once to die. Well, you have an appointment with death. We all understand that. But is that appointment with death at a certain time? And this is just on my little pet peeves, okay? Sorry. Doesn't have much to do with the sermon. But then when you ask somebody about that appointed wants to die and it's written in stone when your date of death is, and you say, what about the people that take their own lives? What about the people that, that, uh, that do something to take their own lives? They say, well, you can shorten it. You can shorten it, but you can't lengthen it, which kind of like defeats their whole argument, I think. So anyway, back to where we were. <laughs> So we're looking at the idea of sacrifice in the Old Testament as one that has to be continually offered. The high priest offers it for all the people. Why do he have to do it and repeat that again and again? It's because as soon as we walk out of the temple, as soon as that sacrifice has been made and we have been cleansed and we are righteous in God's eyes and we walk out and we do something or think something or wish something that is not holy and righteous, then we start the thing all over again and know we're no longer clean in God's eyes. And so they continued this sacrifice over and over and over and over again, and it never ends. And so when people walk out of the temple, do they think that they're good at that point? No, because they realize we're getting ready to mess up again, and we're getting ready to fall back into that hole again, and we're not going to be holy in God's eyes, and what happens to me if something happens to me right now? When I'm not standing there making the sacrifice. And so it's an imperfect way of cleansing. So what do we do about that? What happens about that? Well, it says that Jesus Christ has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear again, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Another little thought just came to mind. My friend Pat from seminary, he said, people got confused about this, about the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
He's not coming back to save us again. He's coming back to judge us, which is what this says right here, which is our understanding that we need to take advantage of the salvation offered through Jesus Christ now because when he comes back, he's, like, he's to, to separate the sheep and the goats. He's going to, to take the folks that have not, have understand what the truth is and have rejected it, and they get separated from the people that trust in him. The other thing that that does for us is that, and I know we probably do that a lot too, just like in the Old Testament, that when we do something wrong and, and, and we think we can't be forgiven for that, you know, it's pretty simple because what Jesus did for us was he covered all that sin in God's sight. All we have to do, we don't have to go out and sacrifice a cow or a sheep or a goat or anything like that. All we have to do is say, I'm sorry, and move on. That's grace. I was talking Thursday night in, in recovery. We, it was communion night, and so about once a month I get to actually say something in recovery. And it came, to, it came about two or three places in, in that evening up until that point that sometimes people have a hard time understanding grace. We understand judgment. We understand rules. We understand law. We understand that a lot of people that come on Thursday nights are there because some judge said you will go do that. And so we can understand that. But it's a hard thing for us to sometimes understand grace. Harder for some folks than others. I had a real hard time with grace. You know why? Because I was raised in a family of 13 grandkids that loved each other and loved my parents and loved my church and all I've ever felt was love. And I understand God is love. But I had a hard time understanding why we even need grace if it's all about love until you really begin to think about yourself and you realize, you know, maybe I don't have it all together. Maybe I don't have an answer for everything. Maybe I'm not always right in everything I do. Uh, my daughter, Missy, she said, Daddy, sometimes Missy says stuff that I'll never forget. She said, Daddy, you always sound like you're right, even when you're not. <laughs> but you see, sometimes you get that idea in your side that everything you do in your side is right and just and honorable, and sometimes it's not, and you have a hard time of seeing that. But at some point, we come to the understanding is that everything I do is not perfect. Everything I do is not good. No amens from the honey back here. <laughs> She's just trying to keep a straight face right now. And so once we come to that understanding that we don't get into heaven because of how good we are, we don't get into heaven because of the, because of the sacrifice that we made somewhere or, or put money in the offer plate, keep putting money in the offer plate, but that's not what gets us to heaven. But when we come to the understanding is that the only way that we get to heaven is through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, that perfect sacrifice, that one-time sacrifice that doesn't have to be repeated. And once we place our trust in him, even when we mess up, we're still holy in God's sight. Not because of us, not because we got it right, not because we always do everything right, but because Jesus Christ did it right for us and he became that sacrifice so that now, when we mess up, we apologize. We ask for forgiveness. We just repent of that, ask for forgiveness, turn away from it, and move on. And say, I'll try to do better the next time. Do we always do better the next time? Nope. But we continue on because we know that because of Jesus Christ, we're not thrown out by God because we messed something up. That we try to do better. That's grace. That's what we need to understand, is that God has done that for us through his son, Jesus Christ. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, not to take our sins away, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Are you waiting for him? Are you ready for him at this moment? 
I often wonder if Jesus came walking in the door. Would I want to run and hide? Or would I want to stand and face him? And say, I've done the best I can. That's all he asks. Just do the best you can. I know that you're imperfect people. Don't know why we were created that way. That's one of those Job questions. We don't know why God didn't make us all perfect. But we're not. Because of the effect of sin in our lives. But when Jesus comes back, he's looking for those that have placed their trust in him. And I pray that that's us. That we would be able to stand and face him. And just say thank you. Thank you for my salvation. Thank you that you saved me from my own sinfulness. Thank you for allowing me to live forever. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your love, for what you've given us, the gift of eternal life, the gift of hope, the gift of knowing you. For your sacrifice made it possible for us to be acceptable to our Father. Your sacrifice made it possible for us to continue to live our lives not worried about what's going to happen to us or what our future is going to be. We offer our thanks to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you all stand and let's just sing. <coughs> What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as But the blood of Jesus. Go in peace. Real peace. Because you know Jesus Christ. Amen.